Welcome back, everybody. Um, our next speaker is Professor Jay Wexler. Um, he is a professor of law at uh, Boston University School of Law, um, where he's uh, won, among other things, the Michael Melton Award for Excellence in Teaching. Uh, he is the author of six books, more than two dozen law review articles and leading journals. And he's also written for uh, the popular media, including uh, Boston Globe, Washington Post, Newsweek, Slate, Spy, USA Today, Vox, and other um, venues. Um, he uh, clerked for Judge David uh, Tattel in the D Circuit of Appeals, and then for, it pains me to say it and everybody to hear it, the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, Professor Wexler is also um, the author of a study, and he puts that in his official bio in quotes, a quote study, unquote, of Supreme Court humor. So, um, with no further ado, um, take it away, uh, Professor Wexler, and um, somebody who does not have their microphone um, muted is typing. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I was hoping to be giving this talk from my, my office in Boston, but instead I'm in this Airbnb here in Washington, DC, uh, because I uh, had to come down at a moment's notice to participate in Justice Ginsburg's memorial, which I have to say is probably one of the most moving things I've ever participated in. So I'm a little bit withered uh, at the moment, but I'm going to I'm gonna I'm gonna push through, and I want to thank uh, I want to thank the uh, the dean uh, uh, Roger Williams and Professor Bogus and the FFRF uh, for putting this together. What an honor it is to be presenting uh, alongside the, uh, my co uh, panelists, scholars, and and thinkers. I actually don't know quite how I squeaked in here, but um, but that's okay. I'll move forward. The title, of course, of the conference is "Is This a Christian Nation?" And uh, as I had published a book right before my invitation uh, arrived that is called Our Non-Christian Nation, I think the organizers might have known what my answer to the question was gonna be. Uh, the paper that I wrote for this conference and that I'm gonna talk about today is kind of an epilogue to the book. Uh, it addresses an issue that is uh, uh, directly related to what I was writing about, but hadn't gotten uh, far enough for me to actually address in the book. So, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it here. And the question is, what happens when a town or a county or some other jurisdi jurisdiction that starts its meetings off with an invocation or a prayer decides to prohibit secular invocations from that invocation program? What's lost when that happens, and is that exclusion unconstitutional? Uh, and the short answer is, a lot is lost, and yes, it's unconstitutional in my view. But in order to take uh, to talk about those questions, I need to back up a little bit and speak briefly about the book itself and what its argument was. And then I'll, uh, after I do that, I'll turn to the specific question uh, of these secular invocations. So the book grew out of two straightforward, I think, observations about the United States that other speakers have uh, discussed already. First of all, that in the past couple of decades, in a series of cases, the Supreme Court has significantly opened up public life to religious participation, public life in the sense of access to government funds, property, and institutions. And then second, the second fact is that at the same time the court's doing that, the nation is becoming more religiously diverse, less Christian, and this diversity includes the growth of the so-called nuns, people who are, do not believe in religion at all, who are atheists or other variations. And the question of the book is, what should religious minorities, including secularists, in which I include myself uh, as an atheist, what do we do in this post-separation of church and state kind of world? What does a religious minority do when the court has let religion into public life? Now, let me say a little bit more about the first point, what I'm specifically referring to uh, um, when I say that, that the court has opened up religion uh, has opened up public life to religious participation. I'm talking specifically about four areas of church state law, which the Supreme Court has weighed in on in the past two, three decades. First, uh, first area is government money. 
that in, in the, the case of particularly Zellman, the Cleveland voucher case, but also Mitchell versus Helms and Espinoza, the court has basically allowed government to fund religious institutions so long as it does so in a formally uh, appropriate way, which is not so hard to arrange. Uh, so we have lots and lots of government money going, for example, to religious schools. Second is government property and religious displays. So in the Van Orden, the, the, the uh, Ten Commandments um, uh, monument case that Professor Green was talking about earlier, uh, uh, American Humanist Association, the one about the gigantic cross, uh, and other cases, the Supreme Court has basically said that, that, it, that many religious displays uh, can be placed on government property without violating the establishment. Third area, has to do with government uh, public schools and religious access to those schools. And here I'm talking about the Good News Club line of cases, which basically says that if a school opens up its classrooms, for example, its property after school and lets sort of uh, clubs and such use it, they cannot exclude religious uh, organizations or clubs from using those rooms as well. And so that's re uh, resulted in quite a few of these Christian Good News Clubs opening up in public schools uh, around the country. Um, and then fourth and finally, uh, government meetings uh, and the, the practice of giving invocations before government meetings. So, and this is what I'm gonna talk about most here in the, the Marsh case and the town of Greece case that have been discussed already, the Supreme Court has basically allowed uh, town boards and legislatures to open up each of their sessions with a prayer specifically to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So in all of these areas, it's now clear, if it hadn't been before, that wide scale religious participation is allowed. And the question is, what does a religious minority do in such a situation? Because the typical, I think, response of religious minorities to the issue of religion in the public square is to stay out of it, is to fight in the courts to get religion uh, excluded from government support and not to partake in the in, in religious religions participation in public life. So what what do we do now? Um, of course, of course, we can continue to fight in the courts and FFRF F and Americans United do great work in in uh, in arguing these cases uh, that are at the margins. But I don't think we're going to get very far in turning the clock back on separation of church and state with our current court, with our Kavanaugh and Justice Gorsuch and Justice Alito. And maybe tomorrow we'll find out also perhaps Justice Amy Coney Barrett, who I, I actually clerked with. She was a, a Scalia clerk when I was a Ginsburg clerk. So. Uh, the fact that she might replace RBG is, is uh, almost too much for me to process. So what options are left if we can't continue to, to fight in the courts? Basically two, either religious minorities stay home and cede the public square to Christianity, or change their approach and seek to participate in public life alongside Christians by asking for government money, putting up public displays, starting clubs in public schools, and giving invocations. Because the cases, uh, the cases that I went through earlier, are they all involve Christians, of course, but they're not limited to Christians. And in the court, in at least two lines of cases, the kind of Larson versus Valente, no discrimination against uh, a religion, a particular religion, uh, line of cases, and then the, the no viewpoint discrimination line of cases under the free speech clause, the court has said you can't, the government can't discriminate against certain religions uh, or certain viewpoints. So minority religions presumably can partake in all, uh, take advantage of all these cases. So that's the premise. And then, um, uh, and then the book makes two claims. One is descriptive and one is normative. And most of the book is really descriptive. It describes how religious minorities, including secularists, have done this increasingly in recent years. Uh, and think about things like Muslim voucher schools. And, and, and the book goes into how sometimes when Christian legislators who are uh, legislators who are really in favor of voucher programs find out that there are in fact Muslim voucher schools, their support disintegrates. Um, think about Wiccan symbols on public property. Think about secular clubs in public schools. There's a great organization, uh, great from my perspective anyways, called the Secular Student Alliance, which helps high school and, and college students start secular clubs in their, pro, in their public schools. Invocations by Hindus and others in front of uh, legislative bodies and town boards, et cetera. There's a lot in the book about my favorite religious organization, the Satanic Temple. 
Uh, but I won't get into them right now. So that's the descriptive point. The normative point is that this, what I think is a somewhat counterintuitive development is a good thing. One that we should celebrate and continue, particularly, I mean, especially given the current court and, there's, and given that there's really no other option. This is really the only thing religious minorities can do. And not only is it the only thing, but there are some benefits for religious minorities from participating in public life. I think it's quite empowering for minorities to exercise rights to equal treatment. It's, I think it's much more empowering than simply recognizing that one has the right. Um, I do also think that the more religion in, that we have in public in the public square and the more different religions, particularly, the more educated our uh, citizenry might become about religion and its alternatives. We're a, a nation that's not very educated about religion. And then finally, and this is the, the most uh, um, difficult claim, and I, I, there's, uh, it's an empirical claim, and I don't think we have much evidence on it, but I I'm, have my hopes that with more religion in public life, we might re uh, end up with more mutual respect and tolerance as people learn about religions, different religions from their own and understand that people who believe other things are not in fact terrible people. So basically the question boils down to, do we want a totally Christian public square or do we want a public square that really has a lot of different religious and non-religious voices, a cacophony of those voices? And I think if you value pluralism at all, then that's really a question that answers itself. So that's the, the book. And now to uh, make the transition to, to the specific issue that I wanna talk about here. The kicker is that for this pluralism to work and work robustly, the courts have to take the Supreme Court's anti-discrimination principles seriously. And, they, uh, um, and, it, and moreover, it has to apply that anti-discrimination principle to explicitly secular or atheist views of the world as well as all sorts of religious ones. Otherwise, this pluralism that I'm talking about is would be partial at, at best. And you might think that this would not be a problem given these lines of cases that the Supreme Court has, uh, has decided. Um, if you can't discriminate on the basis of viewpoint, you can't discriminate on the basis of religion, then it seems like pretty straightforward that you have to include all of these different religious and non-religious voices. And um, before I go any further, I just, I'll quickly address the, the question that's fairly obvious, I think, which is, um, is atheism a religion here? Um, and I wanna make a couple things clear. One is when I'm talking about atheism, I'm not talking about a, a public position that is consistent with atheism. I'm not talking about whether public schools can teach evolution because, uh, or whether that is, is an establishment of religion, which I think it clearly is not. What I'm talking about is, atheism as, uh, as, as, a, as, as truth. Um, and I wanna ask this question uh, or pose this question, which I think everybody will answer the same way, which is could the government teach in a public school that atheism is true? That in fact, there is no God. Um, and I think everybody would say they can't do that. And, and the reason is because it's functionally a religion for purposes of the religion clauses. Now, it might not be a religion in some theological definition or anthropological definition. It might be, it might not be. But for purposes of the Constitution, atheism in the, that, that hard sense of there is no God functions as a religion. And that's, I think, why it can't be taught as truth in the public schools and why I think essentially it counts as a religion for purposes of both the Larson versus Valente kinds of cases and also a viewpoint for purposes of the, the Good News Club viewpoint uh, discrimination is unconstitutional line of cases. But as it turns out, a few jurisdictions around the country have decided that it's not good enough to start almost all of their meetings with a religious prayer to a higher power, but that they also must exclude anyone who doesn't believe in a higher power from ever giving an invocation at a meeting, right? So what we're talking about here is uh, policies to exclude atheists from giving invocations. And nobody thinks that uh, there's gonna be a, uh, a government unit that's gonna have uh, 100 invocations, 95 of which are atheists. Just talking about one or two here and there, but some jurisdictions have actually said, no atheist uh, can give an invocation before a town meeting. And when challenged in the courts, um, those jurisdictions have, have won in both the Third Circuit and the DC Circuit, which upheld the exclusions from constitutional attack. And to me, that's an extremely disturbing development. 
because I think the anti-discrimination principle that I've been talking about is the key linchpin to the only silver lining that I can find in the court's recent pro-religion jurisprudence. If the government can promote religion, but it could also exclude non-religion in the hard sense of there is no God, then I think we're really in trouble. So what I wanna do with the rest of this talk then is first I wanna describe the growing phenomenon of secularists asking to give and then giving invocations. How did it come about? What are secular invocations? What do they typically look like? Where have they occurred? What the reactions have been and why I applaud the trend. Second, I wanna talk about jurisdictions that have banned atheists from giving invocations and the cases that are, have reviewed those bans. Uh, and third, I wanna explain why I think the bans are unconstitutional and why I think the third circuit and the DC circuits have gone wrong here. So the phenomenon of secular invocations. And we should start, I think, uh, with a 1983 case of Marsh versus Chambers, which Professor Green was talking about. And that's where the Supreme Court upheld the practice of legislative prayer in a, in a 6-3 opinion written by Chief Justice Berger. It's one of the most poorly re reasoned uh, opinions in religious religion clause, if not constitutional history. I think in my first book, Holy Hello Blues, I said that probably Justice Berger wrote the opinion in five minutes sitting on the can. Uh, but I actually revised that assessment in my most recent book because I just don't think it took him that long. Uh, Berger ignored all of the harms of legislative prayer that were articulated by the dissent. And the dissent, by, by the way, candidly also said very remarkably that uh, if you gave, uh, you know, uh, a, a, an exam to law students uh, and you said legislative prayer, is it, how does that fit under our precedent? All of them would say it's unconstitutional, clearly. But Berger upheld the Nebraska legislature's practice of legislative prayer simply by observing really that historically the House and Senate uh, provided for chaplains three days before the establishment clause was ratified. There's a little bit more to that, as Professor Green explained, but not that much more, really. Um, um, and then, so that was Marsh. Uh, and the court didn't take up the issue again until about six years ago when it decided Town of Greece, which involved, in, Town of Greece versus Galloway, which involved invocations before the town board in Greece, which is a little town outside of Rochester, which were expressly and consistently Christian, so much so that the Second Circuit just struck it down. The Supreme Court upheld the practice uh, of the town of Greece, five to four. And in doing so, it rejected two purported distinctions between Marsh and town of Greece. First distinction was that the fact that this was a town meeting rather than a legislative body rendered the prayers coercive and thus unconstitutional. Uh, if I'm going before the, the board and I want a zoning request and I'm an atheist and everybody starts saying a prayer uh, to Jesus before the, before the meeting starts, I'm going to feel pressured into participating in that prayer. And the second distinction was that these prayers in Greece were completely sectarian, unlike the ones in Marsh, which actually were less sectarian or not sectarian because a uh, Jewish legislator in Nebraska had complained about them. And so the the, the prayer had changed their practice. Um, I agree, uh, by the way, that this was coercive. I don't agree that the sectarian nature of the prayer should matter, um, bec only because there's just no such thing as a non-sectarian prayer. Occasionally, the Supreme Court talks about a non-sectarian prayer. I, as an, I don't know even what that means. Uh, it's complete nonsense to me that there could be a sectarian, uh, a non-sectarian prayer. And just as Alito, to his credit. Uh, takes that position in his separate opinion in Greece. But the key to Justice Kennedy's opinion in Town of Greece for, for my purposes is the line where he says, um, uh, in response to an argument that the town should not have only invited Christians to give the, the invocations, he says, so long as the town maintains a policy of non-discrimination, the constitution does not require it to search beyond its borders for non-Christian prayer givers in an effort to achieve religious balancing. So the, in other words, the town must maintain a policy of non-discrimination. Wow. Uh, now, Justice Kennedy didn't say what that meant. He didn't say where it came from, but he did say it. And it does seem to me best understood as being rooted in the constitutional principles I already mentioned, because those are the obvious ones. Um, uh, and uh, he's certainly talking about the Constitution. 
So I don't know what else he would be talking about uh, in this particular, uh, with this particular language. In any event, uh, religious minorities and especially atheists and secularists with the great aid of uh, separationist public interest groups like Americans United for separation of church and state, Americans Humanist, uh, the American Humanist Association, and, and also this little uh, outfit out of Madison, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, jumped all over this line uh, and basically started these programs to help atheists and secularists give invocations before town bodies. Uh, Americans United had what they called Operation Inclusion. FFRF had their great Nothing Fails Like Prayer Award, which was supposed to uh, give all of these towns a Thomas Paine in the ass. Uh, and then there was the Central Florida Free Thought Community, which did maybe more than anybody. Uh, uh, this little group uh, in Central Florida read, led by David Williamson, which uh, basically made a campaign to give atheist uh, secularist invocations all over Central Florida. Uh, which is not a particularly liberal uh, region. So in the years since Town of Greece, as a result of this work, something like 100, uh, somewhere between 100 and 200 secular invocations have been given all over the country, many in conservative Central Florida and other conservative counties. If you're interested, you could look at the, the CFFC website because it catalogs very helpfully many of where these invocations came from with links to videos and uh, to, to, the, to the transcript of the invocations, very easy to find online. And you, know, you might wonder, well, what is a secular invocation? What is it like? And the paper I'm, I'm writing has some excerpts there's a wide range of them, hard to kind of categorize them. There's some things, uh, some themes that, that emerge that I identify that are interesting. Uh, the most interesting one is that many of these invocations specifically say, don't bow your head like, a, like in a typical Christian prayer. Look around at your fellow humans because that's what matters. Uh, lots of them uh, do that. It's very interesting. There's an emphasis on science, an emphasis on reason, uh, another theme is the emphasis on equality and inclusion. And finally, uh, an, an, a, a theme that you see pop up in many of these invocations is the interrelationship among people and people with uh, the natural world. I'll just, I'll read one very brief excerpt from, from one of the uh, invocations, one given by Representative Solomon in, before the Arizona House of Representatives in 2019. She said, take a moment to reflect on the wonders of the universe. Bask in the awe and magnificence of the diversity of nature. Look on the, upon the soaring mountains, the vast seas, the cloud-studded azure such skies. Ponder how living things became so immensely diverse on our life-giving planet, how integrated and interdependent is all life meshed on our wondrous earth. Uh, can we truly fathom the depth of the intricacies required to produce and sustain living beings such as animals, plants, microbes, the engines that support the survival of such diverse life forms on an incredibly insignificant planet in an insignificant galaxy in an insignificant corner of an unimaginably immense universe that may possibly be a single speck floating in a sea of universes. It just, it warms my heart. Okay, so what are the benefits of secular invocations? I think that in all the ways that re religious minorities and atheists could partake in public life, the invocation is the one that best promotes the interest in pluralism that I mentioned earlier. Because an invocation is sort of like a mini lecture, a two to three minute lecture uh, about the belief system or non-belief system. There's a captive audience usually. I mean, somebody can leave. And in fact, many times they do. I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. But, but usually people stay. Uh, the citizens who are at the meetings are, by definition, engaged because they're there. They're the people in the town who care about what's going on. And the invocation allows the religious or non-religious belief system to, to give an in-person example, right? So it's not just a monument. It's, uh, it's a person who's there in front, of the, in front of you giving a Hindu invocation or an atheist invocation. And people can look and say, oh, you're not so terrible atheist. You're a normal person. So I think that a lot is lost when uh, uh, any kind of invocation is off the table. Next question might be, what, are, what have the reactions been to these invocations? 
Most of them uh, have gone without incident, actually. Um, I've been to one. I went to see Linda Stevens, who was one of the plaintiffs in Town of Greece uh, versus Galloway, give an atheist invocation at, before the town board that she had sued and brought to the Supreme Court. Uh, I couldn't have missed that. So I went to Rochester just to see this invocation and it was lovely. And in fact, everybody there was very respectful. There was no uh, hullabaloo whatsoever. There was a guy who was sitting right next to me who took off his hat because he thought it was gonna be a prayer. And then when it became clear that she wasn't really praying, maybe he put her uh, hat back on. Um, but uh, but that's, it was a Red Sox hat, so I didn't really care. Um, but there are some other, um, other um, there are some other um, um, uh, jurisdictions where things did not go so well. So at one, one at one, um, the one in fact I just talked about, a, a fellow representative in Arizona uh, ridiculed the invocation by saying, uh, "I would like to introduce my guest now. God, God is in the gallery as He is everywhere. He's the one who created this tiny speck that you keep talking about." Um, and another one, um, a, a commissioner in Florida gave a counter invocation uh, calling upon the Lord and Jesus Christ. Uh, and another one, people got up and left the room. Um, and that has happened more than once, in fact. Um, so so uh, I don't have time to catalog all of these kind of uh, 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 sad responses, but that though they have happened quite a bit. And of course, as I've mentioned already, there are three jurisdictions that have banned invocations from those who do not believe in a higher power. Those jurisdictions are Brevard, Brevard or Brevard County, Florida, the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, and the U.S. House of Representatives. And those cases have all been litigated uh, by, the, by the, uh, the public interest groups that I've mentioned before. The government has won two out of three. The one they lost was the one from Brevard County, Williamson versus Brevard County. The 11th Circuit struck down the, the, the county's exclusionary policy. And the reason is, unfortunately, it was such a bad policy that, that the law that came out of that case doesn't really address the question of could the, could the county have just excluded atheists? Because it turned out that um, they, the commissioners were deposed and they said things like, oh, we wouldn't allow a Hindu either or a Wicca, a Native American, no. So it was clear that they would only really want a monotheist. The other two cases, Barker versus Conroy from the DC circuit uh, and Fields versus Speaker of Pennsylvania House of Representatives um, were two cases which upheld the policies of the United States House and the Pennsylvania House with roughly the same reasoning. Although the Third Circuit opinion was more thorough and detailed and engaged, and in that case, there was also a dissent. Uh, the DC Circuit opinion was written by Judge Tatel, who I clerked for and who I'm not very happy with right now. But anyways, if I, wanted to, if I needed to summarize the rationale of those opinions, it would be something like this. The touchstone for deciding whether something's constitutional in the legislative prayer context is historical practice. The historical practice was that legislative sessions started with a a prayer to a higher being for divine guidance. And so if a current government body wants to limit its invocations in that way, they can do so. And that's basically it. I think the DC Circuit and Third Circuit um, got this wrong. And I, I, I'll make a few preliminary uh, observations and then I'll, I'll tell you what my reasoning is. I think I have about five minutes left. If I'm wrong, somebody can tell me maybe in the chat or something. Uh, preliminary observations. I, I find, first of all, is I actually find the doc. Okay, thank you. Uh, I find the doctrinal part of the of the question kind of the least interesting uh, of all the parts, but I still want to talk about it anyways. Second is I'm not saying here that the Third Circuit and D.C. Circuit's position are plainly wrong. I, I don't think you can say that because Marsh and Greece are so minimalist, and, and you don't even I don't even know really what they're saying. So there's no clear answer about how to apply them. Third, my own view about Marsh, though, is that it should be read as narrowly as possible. It's so poorly reasoned and it's conclusory that I would really argue that courts should not extend it beyond its core holding. And its core holding is simply that a legislature does not violate the Establishment Clause when it starts a session with a prayer. That's all it held. Um, so I don't think the resolution of related or subsidiary questions really have to replicate the original failures of Marsh by unreflectively extending them. The extending the core holding of that case. So those are just preliminary views. As to the substantive analysis, the key is figuring out what to do with the non-discrimination language of, of Kennedy. 
Is that just part of the historical analysis itself and that doesn't add anything substantive? Or is it independent and in addition to the historical analysis? And if it's the latter, what does it mean? What we know about the history, I think, and I'm no historian by any means, absolutely not, and I'm taking this from the 19, from the 1853 Senate report that was quote cited in Greece, and also there was an expert report uh, that was submitted in, in, in the field. I think the fact is probably nobody gave secular invocations or Buddhist invocations or Hindu invocations or Jewish ones really in, throughout history, but there was also probably no formal exclusion either. In other words, there was de facto discrimination, but not formal de jure discrimination. So if the Greece non-discrimination language is kind of baked into the historical analysis, in other words, if it's saying that the government today has to follow the history and the history itself was non-discriminatory, it could only be referring to formal exclusion, I think. But nothing suggests that historically there was a formal exclusion of atheists. So uh, a, a current formal exclusionary policy would not fit into the historical practice. It would be unconstitutional. And that in fact is what the dissent uh, in the Third Circuit case's position was. I don't actually think that Kennedy meant that. Um, I don't think that's the best reading of what he's saying. I think what the best reading is that non-discrimination is an additional and independent requirement that comes from these two lines of cases about viewpoint discrimination and religion discrimination, which would have, should apply here. Um, I think everyone would agree that a government could not, a government body couldn't say, you know, no Jews could give the invocation or no Buddhists can give the invocation. I think it would be hard pressed to find somebody who said that's okay. On the other hand, probably most people would say that a government has not discriminated if it says we're going to exclude people who are going to talk about their favorite sports team or broccoli preparation method, right? So the question might be, are secular invocations more like the former or the latter? And I think it's much, they're much more like the former. And for re the, the reason I gave earlier, which is that functionally atheism functions as a religion for purposes of the religion clause. And so I think the best reading, by no means the only reading of Marsh in time of Greece, but I think the best reading and the reading that best preserves the pluralism that is the really the, the, the only potential benefit from the Supreme Court's line of cases allowing religion to the public square would be to hold that it's unconstitutional to exclude atheists from once in a while giving an invocation before a public body. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. That was terrific. Um, have you ever done any uh, theater? I haven't, but I. But you know what this is? No. It's <laughs> it's it's the producer's thing. Stretch, stretch it out. Stretch. Apparently, Mary Ann Case, who is following you, has technical problems. I don't think she is um, with us at the moment. She's we've. She's informed us earlier that some construction in her building has been intermittently interrupting her internet, and um, she seems to have disappeared for the moment. So let me see whether if there are questions here for you, uh, and there are. Um, Professor Wexler, can you add the the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to your thoughts? That is, should minorities try to use the RFRA to support, for example, their Marxist religion, et cetera. Um, it's, so from John, I, it's from John Ragosta. Uh -huh. And so the, and, and, the, and we're, talk, we're not talking in the invocation uh, context, I take it, um, could, could, well, so the Religion Freedom and Restoration Act, now I have to think what its definition of religion is. So, 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 as a statute, it, we'd have to look and find out what it what religion means under that statute for purposes of the RFRA. Uh, I don't recall um, what it is if if there is. I don't think there is one. Um, uh, could a could a um, so it, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I have trying to think. What would an atheist religious practice be? Um, cause that's that the, the question and the question would be, could a law, if a law, could a law, can we think of a law that would substantially burden the practice of atheism? Um, is the practice of atheism include being able to give an invocation? So let's say it is, um, you know, let's say there's an atheist group that says it is part of our core philosophy that we must speak before, oh, 
before public bodies? Um, would a rule excluding them violate? I'll, I'll think about that for the next 35 minutes. <laughs> As I think the rest of the case is back. Uh, can I, should I? Stop? So I see Professor Case is uh, virtually with us. Um, welcome, uh, Professor Case. Um, uh, Marianne Case is the Arnold I. Shore Professor of Law at the University of Chicago Law School. She has taught at Columbia Law School, at Princeton University, at the American Academy in Berlin, at New York University School of Law, and the Virginia School of Law. She is better qualified than anybody I know to uh, talk about, uh, to do a comparative analysis of law schools. Um, <laughs> She is the author of dozens of articles and book chapters about religious freedom, gender equality, feminism, and other topics. Uh, her work has appeared in the Yale Law Journal, in the Stanford Law Review, the California Law Review, the Supreme Court View, other leading, and other leading journals. She had received her BA from Yale and her JD from Harvard. And she's been having a technologically white-knuckled day I know that, so uh, we're all we're all pulling for you and your internet, Professor Case. Take it away. Thank you so much. And uh, as I as I have explained, I've had more trouble with my internet today than I have the sum total of all other times uh, from the lock, beginning of lockdown to the present. And uh, once you hear my talk, you will understand why some people might say it is the judgment of God on what it is I am planning to say that is causing my internet difficulties. Uh, in addition, uh, I should disclose to you a couple of things. First, this is absolutely my very first PowerPoint um, uh, venture. And uh, I'm uh, hopeful that, you know, I would have been technologically nervous, uh, even if my internet had been functioning normally. Uh, and then additionally, I wish I should say, as you'll see from my talk, I am ranging, you know, throughout the centuries and the religious traditions. And uh, I am making a lot of claims that uh, I am much less sure of than I would ordinarily like to be before I put them into print. And I welcome uh, all uh, intervention by way of correction or additional information or bibliographic uh, suggestions. Um, the, topic, the central topic of my presentation uh, is uh, mentioned in the introductory uh, remarks for the symposium. Uh, it is the so-called Bladensburg Cross or Bladensburg Peace Cross that was the subject of a uh, United States Supreme Court opinion uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, it is a uh, cross erected in uh, memory of uh, 49 uh, particular uh, soldiers and other military uh, who served in the U.S. forces in uh, World War I and came from the general vicinity of Bladensburg, um, Maryland, which is where the cross uh, is established. Um, many people who follow the law of uh, the Establishment Clause uh, were taking bets whether this case would uh, be the subject of a whole new doctrinal approach. I was one of the ones who turned out to be right uh, that, uh, as so often happens in Establishment Clause cases, the court cannot agree uh, on anything like a generalizable test, like, for example, the uh, Smith test that Justice Scalia uh, put in place for um, free exercise cases and which may uh, die the death this term before the court. Uh, instead, there's a welter of opinions and no uh, general uh, thesis that uh, I at least can discern. I'm not going to be talking uh, so much about the uh, legal doctrinal aspects of the case. I'm going to focus on uh, what uh, Justice Alito for the majority uh, did find uh, as a condition of upholding the case, uh, which is that um, this cross um, is the symbol which has taken on a secular meaning. And I'm less interested in whether uh, Justice Alito or the court uh, found this to be so. What I'm fascinated by is that uh, religious liberty organizations, uh, including First Freedoms, 
which uh, represented uh, the named uh, defendant in the case uh, below and took it up to the Supreme Court, uh, that is um, the um, American Legion. Um, these religious organizations in their amicus briefs and in their you know, uh, principal brief and in their argument were also taking the position uh, that this cross is a secular uh, symbol. And that struck me as uh, a very bizarre thing for them to be arguing. So uh, what the title uh, of my talk is, um, Who Conquers With This Sign? Uh, the significance of the secularization of the Bladensburg Cross. And as I said in my summary, um, my own view is that either the devout Christian proponents of the Bladensburg Cross are at heart communionists uh, who are hoping to unite church and state in a Christian theocracy, or they should see it as a Pyrrhic victory if the cross is preserved at the price of denying its religious meaning. Uh, you see in my um, introductory slide, uh, that question, uh, who conquers with this sign, uh, not as a question, but as a statement uh, written in the heavens, in hoc signo vinces, with this sign, uh, you will count conquer, uh, of which uh, the history of which I'll talk about more uh, later. But uh, I was particularly um, intrigued to look at um, this from the perspective uh, of the religious, so I was particularly eager to do this at uh, Roger Williams uh, Law School uh, because famously, um, while Jefferson is thought principally to be concerned, if not exclusively concerned, uh, with the benefits of separation uh, of church and state for the state and the dangers of a lack of separation for the state. Uh, Roger Williams, and I'm oversimplifying wildly, uh, was by contrast interested in the dangers to the church of a lack of separation. Uh, and I've put up um, uh, opposite an image of what I hope uh, can be seen as uh, the garden uh, that Roger Williams describes of uh, as the church, uh, walled off from the wilderness of the world, uh, the famous lines from uh, Roger Williams, The Bloody Tenant, um, that uh, most encapsulate his view. Uh, and in particular, um, his statement that, um, that both the, old, the uh, Jewish uh, in, the, in the Old Testament and the Christians in the New Testament were separate from the world. And when a gap was opened in the hedge or wall of separation between the garden of the church and the wilderness of the world, God hath broken down the wall, made his garden a wilderness, and that if it ever will please him to restore his garden in paradise again, it must of necessity be walled in peculiarly unto himself from the world. Um, this is a separation of holy from unholy. So what I want to uh, explore is the ways in which the Bladensburg cross, the cross through long history, and the arguments uh, in its favor by uh, the religious proponents of its remaining, that is to say, not the city of Bladensburg, uh, but uh, those who from a specifically religious perspective defended it, uh, how this uh, is an exemplification of exactly the concerns uh, Roger Williams raised. So um, I am putting myself, so I've, I've, I've uh, done a version of this talk directly in conversation sponsored by the Federal Society with people uh, who uh, filed briefs and, and uh, represented uh, parties before um, the court. And I'm putting myself I'm, I'm making a case to them from their own Christian perspective. Uh, I, in, in a sense, I'm defining myself vis-a-vis -vis them as Hasatan, not Satan the devil, uh, but the adversary. And what I have said to them um, is that they are betraying Christ in saying that this is a secular symbol. I have invited them to consider um, a uh, version of the story of the denial of Peter that is found in the three synoptic gospels. And, and for those of you uh, not uh, up on your uh, Bible stories, um, 
the story goes as follows. Uh, Jesus uh, had his disciples gathered around him and predicted that he would shortly be uh, arrested and tried and put to death uh, and that all of them would abandon him. And Peter steps up and says, no, no, I'm, I would never abandon you, just never. Um, and on the left-hand side is uh, a uh, sketch from the catacombs from the fourth century um, of um, Jesus is saying to Peter, uh, you think you're not going to betray me, but I'm here to tell you before the cock crows, you will betray me three times. And so Jesus is in fact arrested and almost all the other disciples in fact flee. But Peter, thinking I am going to stick with him, goes further than any of the others. He goes into the courtyard of the high priest's house, and that's the uh, manuscript illustration uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, and uh, he sees Jesus being uh, abused and uh, being readied for trial, and he stands around warming his hands by the fire, and uh, various people, like a servant uh, of the high priest, says, say to him, you know, uh, didn't I see you with this guy? Aren't you one of his disciples? And Peter, uh, as Jesus predicted, said, no, 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 uh, I'm not one of his disciples, never saw him, never heard of him, nothing to do with him. And then, of course, the cock crows. So my argument to the um, religious defenders of the Bladensburg cross as a secular symbol is that they are essentially making Peter's mistake. They are thinking that they are going to go further than anyone else in defense of Jesus and what he stands for, but what they end up doing is betraying him. And uh, I want to put this, so I mentioned that, that this would be a Pyrrhic victory if uh, the way they get the cross to be preserved uh, is by saying that it is secular. A Pyrrhus, of course, is a Roman general who uh, famously said, I know there's such victory and we are lost because of the heavy casualties. I want to turn your attention to another Roman uh, general um, and emperor who um, was the originary of the, um, so the question or the statement that I put up uh, in this sign, uh, you will conquer. And that is, of course, the Emperor Constantine. Uh, Constantine ended up uh, as a Christian shortly before he died. Uh, he uh, made Christianity uh, tolerated under the Roman Empire through the Edict of Milan. Uh, but before that, um, before he became a Christian, before Christianity was tolerated, and 10 years before Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, um, Constantine was in a purely secular war with one of his uh, political rivals, Maxentius. Um, and just before the battle, the infamous so-called Battle of the Milvian Bridge, um, Constantine, who had previously flirted with all kinds of uh, religions, he'd been a devotee of Sol Invictus, the Invincible Son, um, decided, you know, he, he wanted victory and claims and told the church father Eusebius, according to Eusebius personally, uh, told Eusebius late in life that this happened to him. But the night before the battle, he had a vision. Not only he, but his whole army had a vision. And the vision was of a sign in the heavens. What I've shown you here is an example of this from uh, the Vatican, from the Raphael rooms in the Vatican. And it is the sign of the cross. Um, you know, you see, for Eusebius, it was not the cross. It was the so-called hero um, the, the first letters in the word Christ, uh, also to the C and the H, uh, the first letters also in the word Kronos. Uh, but by the Middle Ages, this had been very clearly seen simply as the cross. You see on this uh, image, uh, there's Constantine, he sees the vision, and it says in Greek, not in Latin, in Totonica, uh, in this sign, you will be victorious. Uh, you know, Nika is in Nike, the, uh, the shoe company for, for victory. And uh, here's another, uh, it, this, this is the, uh, the title page I took from Church of Santa Croce in, um, in Florence. Um, and the next day, the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. And you'll see um, the angels are uh, assisting Constantine and there's Constantine who has put the cross on uh, the standards of his legions and uh, 
combined it with the uh, eagle uh, of the Roman Empire. Um, and again, uh, so grateful was Constantine that he uh, immediately made Christianity a tolerated religion, but it went within 10 years from being tolerated to being the official religion of the Roman Empire. Um, and um, Constantine also started meddling in religious matters. He convened the Council of Nicaea, which gave uh, us the still uh, used Nicene Creed, uh, setting forth uh, Christian doctrine. Um, and commingling of church and state in this way uh, also led to uh, another thing that the framers were worried about, which is the church uh, acquiring or seeking to acquire uh, material goods. The final panel in this uh, Raphael Rooms about Constantine in the Vatican is of the legend of the so-called donation of Constantine, uh, where Constantine in gratitude uh, gives to uh, the church the land's uh, substantial territory in uh, Italy that subsequently became uh, the Vatican uh, state. Uh, and then Constant, you know, the Constantine united, in, in a sense, um, the Christian religion uh, with uh, the Roman state uh, by, for example, putting uh, on his coins uh, this standard. So this is, uh, again, the standard of the Roman legion, with the hero rather than the cross uh, on top. Uh, but again, if, uh, if people uh, of Christian faith are looking at this, uh, th they should, I hope, be put in mind of the uh, scriptural passage where uh, Jesus is asked about tax paying and asks for a coin and says whose name is on this and whose inscription. And when he gets the answer, Caesar uh, says, well, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. What we are seeing here is a conflation of the things that are Caesar's and the things that are God's, depending on which side of this coin you're looking at. Uh, and I mention this in the context of the fact that infamously, uh, in God we trust, the motto of the United States prominently appears on the money of the United States. So, you know, with that as a background, with Constantine and his Roman legions, uh, I come back to uh, the Bladensburg Cross case, which is captioned American Humanists versus American Legion. Um, and I want to say um, a lot of discussion uh, in the briefing, in the lower court, in the Supreme Court, had to do with the cross as a quintessentially Christian religious symbol uh, for the death and resurrection uh, of the Christ, uh, with the notion being that was the reason it was on a gravestone, uh, and uh, that the, you know, the, the Christmas holiday uh, may have become comfortable and familiar, as, as Justice Brennan says, and the Christian holiday, as the Puritans would have told you, has always been commingled in its celebration uh, with uh, pagan rites. Uh, the Easter holiday, and before that, the Good Friday holiday uh, of marking Christ's death on the cross, have not had, um, at least when it re when references to cross and resurrection, uh, the same secular traction. I want to basically concede that this cross is not now, um, nor has it ever been, uh, principally uh, a symbol of Christ's death and uh, resurrection. Um, it's a commingling of, secular, of earthly military power and earthly military standards with uh, the Christian religion and has been from the get-go. So I've now, uh, you know, it's hard to see uh, from the photos what's on this, but um, it's the um, seal of the American Legion appears in the middle of the cross. The virtues mentioned are valor, valor endurance, courage, and devotion. And then there are passages from Woodrow Wilson and from others uh, about how these soldiers died for uh, the great cause of preserving liberty. So I, I do think that the cross is about sacrifice, uh, but it's that the soldiers are being analogized to Christ, dying sacrificially for a good cause, not narrowly that their own uh, resurrection is being prefigured. Uh, and it's partly because the cross was not uh, a uh, Christian symbol before uh, the fourth century. It is not 
closely associated with uh, resurrection until after that. Um, and um, yeah, even the Puritan graveyards did not principally feature uh, the cross. Um, why the cross is associated with World War I graveyards, and this is a World War I uh, memorial, uh, the Supreme Court and others make much of, um, and it's this poem written by a Canadian killed in the war, in Flanders feel the poppies blow between the crosses row on row. Uh, again, this is about uh, secular sacrifice. Poppy, we will not sleep though poppies grow in Flanders field, sort of passing the torch on to you. On the right, I've got uh, a photograph that appears in US reports of the current state of the field with the previously wooden uh, crosses uh, replaced by marble crosses and uh, for the Jewish soldiers who wanted it, uh, a Star of David. I think it's interesting, and I'll come back to this later, uh, that the rest of the allies who also focus on uh, this uh, poem uh, focus on the poppies and not the cross. On the left-hand side, I've got a tweet from the Belgian Air Force on the hundredth, uh, on an anniversary uh, of the of World War One, uh, and they're focusing on the poppy. Okay. Um, the cross, though, has been part of uh, American military and political history uh, for a long time. I'm focusing here on the Confederacy because you saw that there were uh, Jewish stars of David and one of the uh, major uh, points of dispute between the majority and the dissent in the Supreme Court and uh, between the various people briefing is whether Jewish soldiers are included in uh, the, uh, the cross symbolism. Um, this is not a new problem, and uh, it was in fact a Confederate problem. Uh, what I have here is a slide of the um, proposed and final uh, Confederate flags and a discussion of them uh, by uh, William Porcher Miles, who was the chair of the Confederacy's committee uh, on the flag and the seal. And he originally wanted something like the cross on the left. Uh, that's uh, a South Carolina secessionist uh, cross. He wanted to remove the South Carolina palmetto and the moon and simply have a Latin cross as the flag of the Confederacy. He got uh, a bunch of um, critical comments from uh, Southern Jews. Uh, I quote uh, Charles Moise, um, who describes himself as a Southerner of the Jewish persuasion. He says, please don't make the symbol of a particular religion uh, the symbol uh, of the nation. And uh, Miles uh, exceeds. And what he says is, I'm going to make it diagonal uh, because then it doesn't stand out so conspicuously that it is a cross. Now, of course, for him, it still was a cross, but he says it's more heraldic than ecclesiastical. It's being the saltire of heraldry, uh, significant of strength uh, from the Latin salto to leap. Actually, it's from the Latin uh, for stirrups and uh, people who mocked the original uh, Southern battle flag said, uh, well, it really looks like a pair of suspenders, not a cross. But I do want to highlight that the idea that it remains a cross, even obliquely, uh, was clear at the time and uh, I believe remains clear uh, to many of those who uh, deplore its decreasing use in the US. Um, among those are people who objected when their Southern state flags um, which previously incorporated some version of the Confederate flag, uh, were reformed uh, to eliminate that notion. The most recent example of this is from uh, Mississippi, uh, which this November 3rd will not only be voting uh, on uh, the president, but will also be voting on its new flag. Uh, on the left, you see uh, the most recent flag of Mississippi, uh, prior flags back to the Civil War uh, were like it in also featuring the Confederate, uh, I'll call it again, a saltier or cross. Uh, it's also the St. Andrew's Cross uh, of Scotland, and many people have said uh, you know, that this uh, reflects the Scotch-Irish uh, heritage of many uh, in the South. I'm not sure the history supports that, but uh, current views certainly do. Um, we've got on the right-hand side um, 
the proposed new flag, uh, it's, I think, significant for the purposes of this symposium to note that the statute that said we're going to get rid of the Confederate battle flag and its disguised cloths said that the only thing that the new flag had to have on it were the words in God we trust. So, you know, if you're focusing on it from the perspective of diversity and inclusion, you can say, well, you know, now that Mississippi is not... Um, any longer explicitly excluding uh, the descendants of slaves. Uh, it's got to be exclusive of someone, so it's going to be exclusive of atheists and put in God we trust uh, up. But I do think that, you know, uh, it's a small step from the, um, from the cross on the old flag to in God we trust uh, on the new one. Uh, which brings me back to uh, Maryland, home of the Bladensburg Cross. Um, and uh, Bladensburg is from a portion, Maryland, uh, of course, was part of the Union officially during the Civil War, but many Marylanders fought for the Confederacy. And among those were people concentrated around the town uh, of Bladensburg. Uh, and uh, the flags come into this, right? A lot of uh, Southern state flags and Confederate flags had crosses on them. Uh, the flag on the left is the flag under which the uh, Marylanders who fought for the Confederacy fought. It's the so-called Crossland flag. It is part of the coat of arms of the founder of uh, Maryland. But before the Civil War, the other part of his coat of arms, the thing that's quartered with the coat of arms on the current uh, uh, Maryland flag, was the flag, the, the black and uh, yellow flag. Uh, as far as I can tell, non-religious symbolism. Um, after the war, only after the war, the cross was incorporated in the flag of Maryland because the idea is we're going to take uh, the, fla the flag under which the uh, state fought for the Union and quarter it with the flag uh, that the Confederate Marylanders uh, fought under uh, so as to exemplify uh, Union after, uh, after the war. Uh, and Maryland also uh, incorporated uh, as its motto, Maryland's historical motto uh, was uh, fati mashi paroli femmini, uh, manly uh, deeds and uh, womanly words. Uh, but they have substituted for it recently, uh, fairly you know, post-Civil War uh, through the you know, 20th century, uh, gradually, uh, a quote from the Psalms, with favor wilt thou compass us as with a shield, Scuto bone voluntatis tuae coronasti nos. Bone voluntatis is, um, you'll remember from Christmas, persons of goodwill. Uh, I, I have to say, you know, my Catholic upbringing um, made me debate exactly the right translation from the Latin Vulgate of this. Uh, persons of goodwill is one way to translate it. Um, persons on whom God's favor rests is another. And um, this is the translation uh, that seems to be uh, the one that the Marylanders are focusing on. And I come back to uh, Constantine and the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. Now, it's one thing for um, the Crusaders, for example, to take the cross as their symbol, or the various knightly orders that defended Jerusalem to take the cross as their symbol, because the cross was literally what they were fighting for. Uh, it's something importantly different, I think, for someone like Constantine uh, or someone like a Christian nationalist uh, to take the cross as a symbol in um, a military or political context because it's saying that God is on our side in a secular battle uh, with another person who uh, either has his own God or is also praying to your God. You are not fighting for God. You are expecting God to fight for you. Um, and this brings me again back to uh, the Bladensburg cross and the uh, inscriptions uh, on it, which have to do with the commingling of uh, godly protection and the sign uh, in which uh, one conquers and uh, military uh, valor. Um, again, I said it was a World War I uh, symbol. Uh, what my next screen shows is all of the uh, medals uh, from uh, World War I of, of all of the uh, relevant uh, countries. 
Um, on the left is the United States uh, Distinguished Service Medal. Uh, again, uh, cross in the back, eagle in the foreground. Constantine would easily recognize this. It's like the standards of his legions, but the eagle is superimposed uh, on the cross and the inscription is for valor, uh, not for any uh, religious uh, virtue. Um, Next to it is the uh, Iron Cross of the uh, German uh, Empire. Uh, I said this is my first PowerPoint. What I'm uh, ordinarily accustomed to doing is to say I do old fashioned visual aids. In particular, I dress up when I talk. Uh, and uh, you may have noticed, you may have been startled to notice uh, that I am in fact dressed up. What I am uh, wearing is uh, an Iron Cross. Uh, and uh, if you saw it before, you might think, is she wearing it because she's a Christian? If you don't know that it's a German military symbol. No, I'm not. Uh, you might, if you didn't know me, uh, say she's wearing it because she's a neo-Nazi uh, or a biker, because the neo-Nazis and the bikers have also adopted the Iron Cross uh, as a symbol. No, this happens to be my, one of my grandfather's two Iron Crosses, uh, which he earned fighting for the Germans in World War uh, I, and it's one of four cross-shaped decorations he earned when doing this. The Iron Cross was also earned by, uh, among two notable recipients, Adolf Hitler and Carl Llewellyn, my uh, University of Chicago predecessor. Although an American, he sympathized with the Germans and performed enough services for them before the Americans entered the war as to be awarded the Iron Cross. Um, it wasn't interestingly until World War I that as far as I can tell, the United States put the cross on any of its military decorations. Previously, the decorations were things like stars. I'm having uh, folks from the Institute of Heraldry and, and the Pritzker uh, Military Museum confirm this for me. But what I, what I wanted to point out is that, you know, everybody on both sides um, chose the cross uh, the rest were uh, more or less Christian uh, nations. You've got the Victoria Cross uh, from the UK at the lower right, and then the Austro-Hungarian Cross, um, and the Belgian and the French Croix de Guerre, each of them combining, as Constantine would uh, readily recognize, uh, military uh, with religious symbolism. And the idea is we wish to conquer uh, but not conquer death as Christ did, but conquer uh, a secular enemy uh, on the field uh, of battle and sacrifice ourselves, perhaps as Christ would, um, in that uh, noble cause. So, uh, you know, some uh, U.S. Uh, military uh, symbols have specifically invoked uh, the Crusaders. Uh, you know, the uh, Mickey Weinstein and the uh, uh, Military F uh, Religious Freedom uh, Organization got this one stopped. Uh, but this is, you know, as I said, the Crusaders are something very different, not the U.S. military Crusaders, the original Crusaders. They were fighting for the cross and for Christ. They were not... Uh, commingling church and state, breaking down uh, that wall that to Roger Williams was so uh, important. Um, so I want to come back to uh, the poem that uh, is used to uh, validate the use of the cross as a World War I uh, military symbol and point out that uh, there are two things uh, highlighted in the poem. The crosses which in various secular instantiations of the poem have been changed to headstones, and the poppies. The United States has interestingly chosen the cross and defended, and now the Supreme Court has validated, uh, the Latin cross as the specific symbol of the World War I dead. The rest of the uh, combatants, like the Belgians, have chosen the poppy. Uh, if you have ever spent time in the UK around uh, November 11th, the uh, uh, Armistice Day, you will see that everybody from the Queen on down wears the poppy as an emblem um, to commemorate uh, World War uh, I, and precisely from this same poem uh, that, uh, from which we get the cross, they get the poppy. So here's my uh, proposal. Uh, you know, there was um, 
at the time uh, this uh, case was in the lower court, uh, the American humanists were proposing, well, if you don't want to take it down, then cut off the arms and make it an obelisk, do something else uh, other than make it a cross. So my question is, why not the Bladensburg poppy uh, rather than the Bladensburg cross? And I commissioned uh, a, uh, a talented architect friend of mine to actually uh, see if this could be uh, realized as a conceptualization. What you have here is her uh, illustration. And she pointed out to me that there actually is already a firm that makes solar panels that are in the shape of a flower and can make them uh, you know, two specifications. So, you know, were it not that the Supreme Court has already uh, blessed the uh, Bladensburg Cross, uh, I would propose that the thing to do is for us to join the rest of our World War I allies and embrace the uh, Bladensburg poppy, uh, and uh, that uh, Christians above all, uh, more than um, secularists or lawyers or Supreme Court justices um, need to answer better than they have hitherto, why not the Bladensburg copy instead of the Bladensburg cross? I'll stop there. Thank you, Professor Case. That was terrific. Um, and um, we're all relieved, as I know you are, that your internet did not fail uh, during that terrific talk. Um, we have just about three minutes before the break. If anybody has, if anybody is a fast typer. Okay, so let me take these three minutes if no one has already put in a yeah, question. Yeah, take it away. Yeah, first of all, now that I'm uh, more full of screen, I'm also wearing poppies uh, embroidered on my jacket. This is, this is low-tech, uh, old-fashioned visual aids. And I will point out that if coming back to Roger Williams and the garden and the wilderness, okay, Poppies are the wilderness. Poppies are a wild flower. So to embrace the cross as a secular symbol is to tear down the wall, whereas to embrace the poppy is to allow the holy to remain holy rather than to um, co-opt the holy for unholy purposes. And I don't mean by unholy necessarily wicked, but not holy, as Roger Williams would say. Right. Well, that explains a terrific um, outfit <laughs> and old-fashioned visual aids. Um, I don't see a question in the chat. I know people get Zoom fatigue, so um, we will take, a, instead of a 15-minute break, we will, we will take a, a, um, uh, a decadent 17-minute break and we will resume at three o'clock Eastern Standard Time with our last speaker, um, Dean Chemerinsky, and followed by a panel discussion uh, with Dean Chemerinsky and Professors Wexler and Case. See everybody in 17 minutes on the hour. Hi, everybody. Um, we are waiting for Dean Chemerinsky and if um, Professors Wexler and Case are um, available, um, if they could rejoin us, um, we will um, pose whatever questions we have from the audience uh, to them while we're waiting for um, Dean Chemerinsky, who we're frantically trying to reach at this very moment. Um, Jay, I see you're there. Marianne, there are you. So I think we have some questions. Um, thank you for um, appearing instantly <laughs> on request. And uh, I've got a question here um, for Jay. Uh, for Professor Wexler, you mentioned that Muslim religious school vouchers made legislators rethink their position on religious vouchers. Besides the po positive pluralistic impacts of minority religious and non-religious participation, will this public participation reveal a potential Christian bias running through recent First Amendment jurisprudence and precipitate a similar retraction of religion from public life in general? This question is from Jonathan Stark. Um, if I understand the question, <clears throat> uh, 
I, I, I think the answer is yes. And it's not, and, and the, the group that's really pushing that is the satanic temple uh, because um, opposition to atheists and, and Muslims is certainly, uh, certainly out there, but, but you should see how people react when the satanists come to town. So, um, for example, uh, so, 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 and in fact, the Satanists, and I'm specifically talking about this group, the Satanic Temple, not other uh, forms of Satanism, but this group is, uh, they, they purposefully uh, ask to participate in public life alongside Christians, for example, by putting up their nine foot Baphomet monument on, uh, in Arkansas. And, and, and giving invocations before boards. And they know that when the, when the, when the public uh, realizes that, they're, that, the, that the Satanists are gonna give an invocation, for example, uh, it makes them very, very <laughs> worried. And sometimes they shut down the entire, whatever the program is in, entirely. So this happened in, in Phoenix. The, the Phoenix had a, had a policy to start their city council meetings off with a prayer. Um, so the, uh, the Satanic Temple asked to give a prayer. The, the city council first said, yeah, because um, they had to. And then when it became clear to everybody that there were in fact Satanists that were gonna give a prayer, the city council, the, the, the city of Phoenix went bananas and they had a, they had a like three hour public meeting, uh, which you can find online, which was basically where a Christian nation over and over and over, people t- taking out dollar bills and saying, it says, in God we trust, not Christ- uh, Satan. And, tr-. and so eventually what happened is they just decided to switch to a moment of silence instead of, uh, instead of a prayer. And so and things like that have happened. Um, Sorry, actually, just- Sorry, Jay, I'm just going to interrupt you one second to let... Uh- Roger Williams, I T know that uh, Professor uh, Chemerinsky is uh, typing into the question and answer function that he is here. Can we hear him? So, Roger Williams, I T, uh, see what you can do, uh, Professor Wexler. Um, sorry, keep keep. Uh, yeah, so uh, the I mean the the the, the best the my favorite example of this phenomenon is um, uh, when a county in Florida started uh, handing out Bibles to their public school students. The, um, they didn't hand them out. They kind of had them on a table. People could take them or not. And the Satanic Temple made what's called the uh, Satanic Book of, uh, the Satanic Coloring Book, and oh, the Big Book of Satanic Activities. And it's just like the seven page booklet with like a word search uh, for words like justice and freedom and, and a maze to find uh, Satan and stuff. And, uh, it, and, and the town of Florida, the, the town in Florida, the county just said, we're not gonna let any religious materials be distributed anymore rather than have that go out. So, so yes, it happens. Right, thank you, thanks. So um, uh, Dean Chemerinsky has joined us. Uh, before I introduce him, um, let me just say a, a, a couple of housekeeping uh, things. And uh, first is a reminder to everyone that if you have questions uh, for our afternoon presenters, uh, uh, Professors Wexler, Professor Case, Dean Chemerinsky, uh, type them into the question and answer function. And uh, I'll, uh, you know, time permitting, I will, uh, um, I'll read all of them that I can in the panel discussion. Uh, following Dean Chemerinsky's um, talk. Um, I do want to uh, just publicly thank um, Roger Williams IT and Joe Auger and Roger Williams um, Law School Law Events, Chelsea Horn and Jane uh, Govnik for uh, all of their work on this symposium. Uh, um, it's been it's it's been a lot of work in the Zoom world, and um, and and thank you so so much. Um, I do want everybody to know that um, all of our um, speakers today um, that this that this is a this project uh, is a two step project, a two prong project, um, and the first prong is this uh, you know this symposium live that you've been watching today. Uh, the second part is that all of um, the contributors to this symposium um, are contributing um, major original articles to a special symposium issue of the Roger Williams University Law Review, 
um, which will publish um, their papers in this in this special um, issue. Uh, thanks again to the Freedom from Religion Foundation for a very very generous grant, which will allow us, among other things, um, to uh, print a uh, especially uh, large uh, run of uh, this symposium issue and to distribute um, the issue to, uh, to federal judges and law professors uh, throughout the nation. Um, with that said, let me introduce um, Erwin Chemerinsky. Um, his visage will be familiar to many of you because he is a recognized public intellectual. Um, in addition to a uh, teacher and scholar, he is the Dean and the Jesse Chopper Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. Uh, he was previously the founding Dean and Distinguished Professor at the uh, University of Chicago, Irvine School of Law, uh, where he also held a joint appointment with the P Political Science Department. Prior to that, he taught at Duke and UCLA and Southern Cal and DePaul Law Schools. He is the author uh, or editor of 11 books, and this is not hyperbole, hundreds of professional and popular articles. Um, his most recent book is We the People, a progressive reading of the Constitution for the 21st century. That is, assuming he hasn't written one over lunchtime today, uh, and uh, or it's, it's, it's just he hasn't because it's just coming up on lunchtime in Berkeley, California. Um, as I've mentioned, he's a public intellectual. Uh, he was named one of the top 20 legal thinkers in America uh, by Legal Affairs. Um, he's twice been named uh, the most influential person in legal education by National Jurist. Uh, he received his uh, bachelor's degree from Northwestern and his law degree from Harvard University. Um, Dean Chemerinsky, or is yours? Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thank you for letting me be part of this terrific symposium. I wish we could have all been together in person. And I apologize for the technical difficulties. I was listening to you and hearing Professor Wexler and frantically thinking, out, how do I get on as a participant? So thanks for your patience with regard to that. The symposium asks the question, is the United States a Christian nation? The answer must be a resounding no. The country is not now, never has been, and hopefully never will be a Christian nation as a matter of law. In 1791, in the Treaty of Tripoli, the United States declared, and I quote, the government of the United States is not, in any sense, founded on the Christian religion. To be sure, there have been proposals in American history to amend the Constitution to make it officially a Christian country. There was a proposal introduced in 1864 by the National Reform Association that would have amended the Constitution to say, quote, humbly acknowledging Almighty God is the source of all authority and power in civil government, the Lord Jesus Christ is the ruler among nations, and his revealed will is the supreme law of the land in order to constitute a Christian government. It got nowhere in Congress. In 1950, there was a proposed amendment where it said that it is to recognize the authority of the law of Jesus Christ's Savior and ruler of nations through whom we are bestowed the blessings of liberty. Didn't get anywhere in Congress then either. So I think that these proposals failed miserably tells us something that even at those difficult times, there wasn't enough support to get it through a congressional committee, let alone through Congress. And yet there continues to be this myth that we hear all the time that this is a Christian nation. The phrase in part comes from Justice David Brewer in Holy Trinity versus the United States, where he wrote, quote, America is a Christian nation. Now, there are commentators who say this today. James Dobson from Focus on the Family says that the United States was established as a Christian nation by Christian people. Now, when I say the United States is not a Christian nation, I'm saying it is a matter of law. As a matter of social reality and social practice, 
there are over 200 million Christians in the United States. I am Jewish, and I'm often acutely aware that we live in a Christian country. Christmas, despite what some say, certainly feels omnipresent to one who doesn't celebrate the holiday. But my view is that as a matter of law, the Constitution was meant to create and should be interpreted as creating a secular government. I am very embarrassed to say this after the kind introduction, but I do have a new book that came out September 1st, and it's titled The Religion Clauses. It's co-authored by Howard Gilman, published by Oxford University Press, that was published September 1st of 2020, and it is very much relevant to what this symposium is about. In it, we defend both with regard to the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause, the importance of separation of church and state. I wanna make three points today, and they certainly parallel what Howard Gilman and I argue in our book. First, historically, the United States was never meant to be a Christian nation. Second, as a matter of constitutional interpretation, we should interpret the Establishment Clause as creating separation of church and state. And third, I want to talk about what I fear for the future, especially with the newly constituted Supreme Court. So let me take each of these points briefly in turn. First, in terms of history. I know others have discussed this. Those who framed the Constitution were very much aware of the religious strife that existed in England and existed in many countries before the United States. Those who formed the United States government rejected the idea that there should be an officially established religion in forced conformity. Those who formed the Constitution chose to have secularization of government and tolerance of all religions. What evidence can I point to in support of this? Well, the Constitution has no reference to religion or to supreme being. We often forget the first few words of the Constitution, we the people. It was the people who created the United States government. It wasn't said to be divinely inspired or divinely empowered. Congress was given no authority to legislate over matters of religion. Article 1, Section 8 details 18 powers of Congress. If you count the subparts, many more than that. There's no mention there of any ability to create a national church. The Constitution in its text, apart from its Bill of Rights, says there can be no religious test for federal office. I believe that the framers of the Constitution saw themselves as products of the Enlightenment, where reason was replacing religion as the basis for authority and the basis for decisions. It's not coincidental that when a Bill of Rights had to be added, the First Amendment starts with provisions with regard to establishment and free exercise. Why is that? I think there's an internal coherence to the provisions of the First Amendment. It begins by talking about freedom of conscience, the ability of each of us to decide for ourselves what to think, including how to worship. It then moves on from that to say how we express ourselves the freedom of speech that we possess, the ability we have to take our ideas and use them to petition government, the ability we have to persuade others by assembly, by freedom of the press. And so I don't think it was accidental that the First Amendment embodies this idea of a secular government and of tolerance of all religions. To be sure, some of the state constitutions prior to the US Constitution, did enshrine religions. There were official state religions, even some that survived the United States Constitution. But these were fading away by the time of the United States Constitution. If you look at the state constitutions that were written between 1776 and 1800, and there were 19 of them during this time, they all protected religious freedom. Georgia adopted a new state constitution in 1798. And it said, nor shall any person be denied the enjoyment of any civil right, merely on account of his religious principles. 
isn't that Georgia saying in 1798, that as a matter of law, we're not a Christian nation. One of the most famous fights with regard to the government and religion occurred in Virginia. In 1784, Patrick Henry proposed a property tax to support ministers of Christian sects. None other than James Madison and Thomas Jefferson opposed this. Some of the most famous writings that we take today about the meaning of the Establishment Clause come from what they said then. Is of course in this context that Thomas Jefferson uttered the famous words, there's a wall that separates church and state. And so it was that states that had official religions began to repeal them, and they were all eliminated by early in the 19th century. And so it was that the new American Republic rejected centuries old European practice of linking government authority to a favored religious tradition or sect. So it was that while the government would have secular identity, it also recognized the people would free to exercise the religions of their choice. Make an historical argument, but I think the more important point I wanna make is the second, that the constitution should be interpreted is separating church and state. And that includes the constitution should be interpreted, reject any idea that we're a Christian nation. I am not an originalist. I realize that we can never really know what the framers of the constitution intended. And while I can marshal the quotes from Madison and Jefferson, somebody on the other side can probably find quotes too. The world we live in today is so vastly different than the world of 1787 or 1791. It would be a mistake to say we have to be governed by their conceptions of religion. We are so much more a diverse, pluralistic society with regard to religion than existed then. And so I believe that what the Establishment Clause should be interpreted to mean is that to the greatest extent possible, there should be separation of church and state. I think that we should take it as Thomas Jefferson got it right when he said there should be a wall that separates church and state. The government should have no official religion, should have right, no support to any religion. Why? And again, I, I think I could make a historical originalist argument, but that's not what I believe in. Let me make several arguments that I think are quite important um, as to why we should have a secular government and certainly never be a Christian nation. The first is everyone should be able to feel that it's their government. No one should feel like outsiders. No one should feel like insiders relative to their government. This was the wisdom of Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. She very much explained this in saying that we need to have the government be secular and not endorse religion. So no one feels like an outsider. Let me just read a few words from Justice O'Connor here, where she says, and, and I'm quoting her, Endorsement of religion by the government sends a message to non-adherents that they're outsiders and not full members of the political community, and an accompanying message to adherents that they're insiders. I argued a case in the Supreme Court in March of 2005, Van Orden v. Perry. It involves a six-foot-high, three-foot-wide Ten Commandments monument that sits directly at the corner the Texas State Capitol and the Texas Supreme Court. I was representing Thomas Van Orden, a homeless man who brought a challenge against this. At one point in the oral argument, Justice Kennedy said to me, with real hostility in his voice, if your client doesn't like the Ten Commandments monument, why doesn't he just look the other way? And my answer was, we don't excuse constitutional violations by ignoring them, and there would be no stopping point then a city could put a large cross atop City Hall and say, if you don't like it, look the other way. And of course, then all who are not Christian would feel that it's not their government. If I had to go testify before city council or state committee or house judge committee that had a cross behind the members, I would certainly not feel that it was my government. I think there's a second reason why I favor separation of church and state and that it's wrong to tax people 
to support the religions of others. This isn't just an idea of liberal law professors early in the 21st century. It was none other James Madison who said that in opposing the tax that Patrick Henry posed. James Madison said it would be, quote, immoral to tax people to support the religions of others. There are religions that believe that people of my faith cannot go to heaven. There is such a thing. Or believe that people of my faith are doomed to something far worse. And they're allowed to have that belief. But I shouldn't have to pay my tax dollars for them to teach or proselytize that belief. But inevitably, if the government becomes aligned with religion and the government can tax people, then I am supporting religions that are anathetical my own and that teach things about my religion that are deeply disturbing. A third reason for separating church and state is to prevent coercion. Inevitably, the government becomes aligned with religion. People feel pressure to participate. This is what the Supreme Court said in the early 1960s in cases like Engel versus Vitale and Champ versus Abington School District, where the court said that even voluntary school prayer is inherently coercive. And I have an anecdote to tell here. When my youngest child, my daughter, was in kindergarten, she was in a Los Angeles public school. And she proudly came home after about a week of kindergarten and showed my wife and I how she could recite the Pledge of Allegiance from memory. And it included the words under God. And it was right around the time the Ninth Circuit had said that under God and the Pledge of Allegiance was unconstitutional. And my wife turned to me and said, didn't the Ninth Circuit say that they can't use the words under God and the Pledge of Allegiance? And my daughter interrupted and said, oh, you have to say those words or you get sent to the principal's office. Now, that's not what anyone in her school said to her. But what she had internalized in a week of kindergarten is you do this or you're in trouble. We know of the kinds of pressures that exist in school at all levels, but it's not just there. I remember when I heard that John Ashcroft was doing Christian prayer breakfast in his office at the Justice Department. Did you want to be an insider and go to the Christian prayer breakfast, or were you going to be an outsider within the Justice Department? The coercive pressure is enormous when the government becomes aligned with religion. And fourth and finally, I believe we separate church and state to protect religion. This isn't a new idea. In fact, Roger Williams was the one who very much talked about the importance of separating church and state to protect the church. The more the government becomes entangled with religion, the more the government is regulating religion. This too is a notion that not only is old, but it was uttered relatively recently. This past June, in Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue, where the Supreme Court said, effectively, when the government gives money to secular private schools, it must give it to religious schools. It was Justice Breyer who raised the concern of how this is going to enmesh government with religion and how it's going to endanger religion as well. Well, because time is limited, I just quickly sketched out why I believe there should be separation of church and state and why, as a matter of law, we should never allow the United States to be a Christian nation. But this takes me to the third and final part of my remarks. What about the future of the Supreme Court? Until last Friday, I would have told you that there are five justices on the court that reject the idea of having a wall that separates church and state. Now I believe with a nomination and likely confirmation of, six, of President Trump wants, there'll be a sixth justice who rejects any idea of a wall separating church and state. I think that they will, through their decisions, allow state and local governments to make it, from a practical perspective, a Christian nation. I want to try to give examples so you don't think this is hyperbole. Um, let me look at this with regard to both separation of church and state and free exercise of religion. In 1947, in Everson versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court said that the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment applies to state and local governments. It's often forgotten that in that decision, all nine justices accepted that Thomas Jefferson's metaphor of a wall separating church and state explains the Establishment Clause. 
In fact, all nine justices subscribe to the idea that there should be a wall that separates church and state, a wall that's, quote, high and impregnable. But we have had five justices in the last few years, and soon to be six, who reject the idea of a wall separating church and state. Their view is that the government violates the Establishment Clause only if it coerces religious behavior. And in fact, there are two justices now, Thomas and Gorsuch, who don't believe that the Establishment Clause applies to state and local governments at all. Justice Thomas has long taken the position, now Justice Gorsuch just joined him, that the Establishment Clause, in their view, was just to keep Congress from creating a national church to rival state churches. And so if a state wants to become an official Baptist or Mormon or Christian state, it's able to do so. If it wants to have mandatory prayer, it can do that. But even if the other conservatives don't go that far, and I don't think they will, we've seen in recent years how much the court, by rejecting the wall separating church and state, allows government effectively to make it a Christian nation. I'll give a couple of examples. Several years ago, there was the case, Town of Greece versus Galloway. Town in upstate New York invited Christian clergy members to deliver prayers before the town board meetings. Every month for many years, just Christian clergy were invited. There was an objection, and for a few months, they invited non-Christian clergy, and then for a few more years, went back to just Christian clergy. Almost all of the prayers were explicitly Christian in their content. The United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit said, this is clearly a violation of the Establishment Clause. The government has become in line with a particular religion. The Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, rejected that. Justice Kennedy wrote the opinion for the court, and the court approved allowing a town to have sectarian prayers for town board meetings over a long period of time. Or take a case from June of 2019, American Legion versus American Humanist Association. It involves a 45-foot cross that sits on public property at a busy intersection in Prince George County, Maryland. The United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit found this to be unconstitutional. The Fourth Circuit said, a cross is a quintessential Christian religious symbol. It doesn't belong by itself on a busy intersection on public property. The Supreme Court, and it was seven to two, reversed and said that it was permissible to have the cross there. Well, what does it mean that we're gonna have five and I think six justices who take the view that the Establishment Clause is violated only if there's coercion with regard to religious behavior? Religious symbols on government property will be allowed without exception. The government can put nativity scenes and crosses anywhere it wants. And there's going to be no basis for objection. No longer there will be justices who say that the question is, is there an endorsement of religion? No longer the justices who will have a, they'll be able to comprise a majority to take that position or take the position of separation. I think that the accommodationist justices, the six who are there, will allow religious symbols. I think they are going to allow much more religious presence at government activities like prayer at town board meetings. Not only are they going to allow aid to religious schools, they're going to require aid to religious schools. For decades, the issue was, when is it permissible for the government to give aid to a religious school? And a complex body of law developed. But now the conservative majority is saying, if the government is giving aid to a secular private school, it is constitutionally obligated to give that same aid to religious schools. The court began down this path in Trinity Lutheran versus Comer in 2017. Justice Sotomayor in her dissent pointed out this is the first time in history the Supreme Court had ever said the government was required to give aid to religion. But footnote three in that decision said it was just an aid about a case about aid to playgrounds. But we saw in Espinosa versus Montana Department of Revenue in June of 2020 that it's not just about aid to playgrounds, that the court's going to say that anytime the government gives aid to secular institutions, it must give it to religious institutions. During the early years of the George W. Bush administration, there was a great debate about whether or not there should be charitable choice. And what this meant was 
when the government gives money to secular institutions, like for preschools or drug rehabilitation or alcohol rehabilitation, should it be able to give that aid to religious institutions? Now what the Supreme Court has done is take a policy question and turn it into a constitutional requirement saying the government must do so. Now I said I also want to say a word about free exercise of religion. 30 years ago in Employment Division versus Smith, it was Justice Scalia who said that there's no basis for a religious exception from general laws. That people shouldn't be able to claim their religion as a basis for violating the law. I have never seen a constitutional issue where the sides have flipped so dramatically. It was the liberals who criticized Employment Division versus Smith. But now it's the conservatives who have rejected Employment Division versus Smith, and it's the liberals who've come to embrace it. Why? Religions are claiming the ability to discriminate, say, against gays and lesbians in all as aspects of life. And I think we now will have five and probably six justices who say that bakeries and florists and stationery stores and photographers can refuse to serve gays and lesbians at their weddings. I think we're going to see from the Supreme Court case this term, Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, the courts say that a social service agency has the right to discriminate against gays and lesbians and still participate in placing children in foster care. I even will say, I think there are five justices who will vote to overrule Employment Division versus Smith. There's always a tension between liberty and equality. Any law that prohibits discrimination limits the freedom to discriminate. We've made the choice as a society for well over 50 years that stopping discrimination is more important than the freedom to discriminate. But now we have a majority of the court that's going to say that people in the name of their religion can discriminate. And inevitably, this is about Christians, Catholics who want to discriminate, discriminate with regard to providing services, discriminate in employment, discriminate with regard to contraceptives. I very much lament the direction this is going. I don't think it's going to lead to it ever officially being declared a Christian nation, but I think it's going to practically have that effect. So I would just conclude, since I'm at the end of my 30 minutes, by again going back to Justice O'Connor. Soon after she left the court, soon before she left the court, in her last opinions about the Establishment Clause in June of 2005, she wrote some words that I think we should remember. Justice O'Connor said, by enforcing the religion clauses, we have kept religion a matter for the individual conscience, not for the prosecutor or the bureaucrat. At a time when we see around the world the violent consequences of the assumption of religious authority by government, Americans may count themselves fortunate. Our regard for constitutional boundaries has protected us from similar travails, allowing private religious exercise to flourish. Those who would renegotiate the boundaries between the church and the state must therefore answer a difficult question. Why would we trade a system that has served us so well for one that has served others so poorly? Why indeed? Thank you, Dean. That was, uh, that was terrific. Um, if uh, Professors Wexler and Case can join us, um, we will have our um, last um, discussion session. And I will read uh, questions from the chat function to them. Uh, there's still time to type in questions. Um, if you have questions for our, even, for our afternoon panelists. Um, and um, I, th I think, um, I don't think I read this one before. Uh, from Jonathan Stark uh, for Professor Case as a response to, uh, maybe I did read that one before. So let me no. start from Patrick Elliott, huh? You didn't. I didn't, okay. Uh, for Professor Case as a response to creative poppy modification for the Blandenburg Cross. 
What would your response be to advocates for preserving the cross as an important historical landmark and not as a religious symbol, while potentially dispensing with the religious aspect of the cross? Many preservationists might take exception with such a modification as damaging its historic significance or integrity. So I think this gets to one of the reasons why the court dissolves into a welter of opinions and what Justice Kennedy long ago correctly called a jurisprudence of minutiae when it deals with um, monuments and symbols. Um, the particularities of the Bladensburg Cross, as I understand them, and I don't think that this is very controversial, is that this is not a particularly distinguished monument from an architectural or historical perspective. It is significant to anyone, uh, preservationists, uh, the inhabitants of Bladensburg, the descendants of World War I veterans, because of what it commemorates not because of the significance historically or architecturally or artistically of the way it does that. Now, some people say the significance is that it is a cross, and that's exactly what my talk was about. But, but preservationists would, would fall, I think, into two camps. The camp of people who uh, care about the um, material character of the cross is in this particular instance, although I can imagine lots of counterexamples, um, a small one, right? The people who want to preserve it want to preserve it because of its significance as a memorial for the dead. And that has, uh, I think, little to do with whether it becomes a poppy or um, remains a cross. I have a question here from Patrick Elliott. I think um, based on the time that he posted it, it's probably to uh, Dean Chemerinsky. Do you believe there is a significant risk that the Supreme Court will invalidate most state constitutional no aid provisions as violating free exercise? What impact do rulings like Espinoza have on state rights? Yes, I believe there is a real risk that the Supreme Court will invalidate those no aid provisions. I direct you to Justice Alito's opinion in Espinoza, who he wrote the opinion that basically would say that he believes those no aid provisions were motivated by hostility to religion and should be struck down on that basis. Now, I think there's so much that's wrong with this. First, many states had no aid provisions even before Blaine amendments began. New Jersey had a no aid provision in its constitution before there was a United States constitution. Also, the Supreme Court has said that the motive behind a law isn't a sufficient basis for invalidating the law. Look at Chief Justice Warren's opinion in the United States for Sobrian. Third, I'm concerned about it from a federalism perspective that I really believe that states should be able to make those choices for themselves. It's 43 states that have no aid provisions in their state constitutions. But I think what the Supreme Court is likely to say is that that violates free exercise. And I don't see any way to read Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in either Espinoza or in Trinity Lutheran as other than saying, when the government gives aid to private secular institutions, it must give that same aid to religious institutions unless doing so would violate the Establishment Clause, and very little will violate the Establishment Clause for these justices. Uh, from Nicholas Little, with, Brian, with Breyer and Kagan consistently joining the accommodationists, is it realistic to talk about 6-3 rather than 8-1 when it comes to future establishment cases? Breyer and Kagan sometimes join the accommodationists and sometimes not. Let me start with the sometimes not. Town of Greece versus Galloway was five to four, and Justice Kagan wrote a terrific dissent joined by Ginsburg, Sotomayor, Ginsburg Breyer, and Sotomayor. Um, in Espinoza, which we were just talking about, it was five to four, and Ginsburg, Breyer, and Sotomayor each wrote dissents, which Kagan joined. On the other hand, Breyer has not always been with the strict separationists. 
I lost Van Orden versus Perry five to four because of Justice Breyer. Um, I've got to tell you, as I wrote my brief in that case, as I prepared to argue, I was convinced it was all about Sandra Day O'Connor. I made my brief a shameless attempt to pander to Justice O'Connor. If I could have put Justice O'Connor's picture on the front of my brief, I would have done so. <laughs> the week before the oral argument, a reporter called me and said, you cite Justice O'Connor 23 times in your brief. And I said, yes, yeah, so I got O'Connor's vote, but Breyer concurred in the judgment. And it was the fifth vote to allow the Texas Ten Commandments Monument. On the other hand, that same day, it was 5-4 in the Kentucky case with his voting to strike down the Ten Commandments monuments there, or the Ten Commandments displays that were there. Um, Breyer and Kagan were with the majority seven to two in Trinity Lutheran. They were the majority with the majority last year, seven to two in American Legion versus American Human Association. They were the majority seven to two in the Our Lady of Guadalupe School this term. They were the majority seven to two in Little Sisters of the Poor versus Pennsylvania. So in those cases without Ginsburg, it would be eight to one. And I think that Ginsburg not being there matters in another sense as well. She was born in 1933. She had seen anti-Semitism in a way that none of the other justices, even the Jewish justices had. And she talked about that. And I think she could bring that human experience into why it's so important that we not be legally a Christian nation why it's so important to be separation of church and state. And I think losing that voice on the court is a really major loss for the justices in the nation. From uh, Philip Primo, uh, Dean Chemerinsky, why should we conclude that the establishment clause was meant to apply to the states given the existence of state churches, parish tax schemes, and religious tests in the early republic and the persistence of religious tests in early modern times. Furthermore, shouldn't we respect, shouldn't respect for democratic self-governance lead us to afford state and local communities the discretion to govern themselves with respect to moral and ecclesiastical matters? Let me take this one at a time. The key question is not what was intended about the Establishment Clause in 1791. It was thought that none of the Bill of Rights applied to the states in 1791. Chief Justice Marshall in Barron versus Mayor and City in Baltimore said it's an easy question. The Bill of Rights was meant to the federal government. It was the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protect, the Due Process Clause especially, that was interpreted to apply the Bill of Rights to state and local governments. So I think it's a mistake to say, what did the framers intend in 1791? But I also think it's a mistake to focus on what the framers intended. I think the question always has to be, what's the best way of interpreting the Constitution? Now, I could certainly make an argument, and we make it in our book, as to why separation of church and state is what the Establishment Clause is about. But I think for now, I've tried to give the reasons why that's the better perspective. Um, should we leave this to just state and local determination? Um, no more than we should leave freedom of speech, or equal protection, or cruel and unusual punishment, or due process to state and local interpretation. Um, I think that it's crucial that we enforce the basic rights of the Constitution against state and local governments. And I think one of those basic rights is found in the Establishment Clause and another in the Free Exercise Clause. And I think that includes separation of church and state. Um, Professor Wexler, Professor Case, do you want to add anything? At the end here? So I want to add uh, a question to anyone who can answer it, which is, I uh, agree with what uh, Dean Chemerinsky said about the future of state amendments, including but not limited to Blaine amendments. What puzzled me is that um, in Espinoza versus Montana, the court fudged that. It didn't say, I mean, clearly implied that these amendments were gone, but it didn't have the courage of its convictions to make them go quite yet. So that I agree that, you know, the, the trajectory is clearly for them to be gone, but I'm not clear why they're not already gone um, from either a drafting or a broader perspective. Um, let me, if nobody else is going to, 
Go ahead. I'll answer your question with a question and then try to answer the question. Why has the lemon test survived? After all, there's five votes to overrule the lemon test. And my answer to that is because the court has not needed to overrule the lemon test to accomplish whatever it wants in advancing religion. The court can uphold the cross in American Legion versus American Human Association without needing to overrule the lemon test. The court can approve the prayer in town of Greece versus Gallery without overruling the lemon test. I think the court's been able to do what it wants with regard to requiring aid to religion without needing to declare those provisions facially unconstitutional. I think Alito wanted to go there in Espinosa, and that's why he wrote the opinion he did. I think the Supreme Court can achieve exactly the same thing without declaring facially unconstitutional by the path that they set out in Trinity Lutheran and Espinosa, requiring government aid go to religious institutions when it goes to secular institutions. Um, and so, and also, Professor Case, this is a new path. Trinity Lutheran is three years old. Espinosa is three months old. Um, so I, I wouldn't say we're at the end of that path. So I've got, I have a question and, and um, I skate on thin ice of, uh, on a asking it because um, uh, constitutional law is not my uh, principal, it's not, it's not an area of my, um, of my scholarship except for Second Amendment scholarship. Um, but in this question about whether the Establishment Clause should be incorporated uh, by the 14th Amendment um, against the states, um, isn't, isn't, the, isn't the test, the Palco test, and, and didn't Cardozo develop that? And isn't, isn't it something along the lines that what is incorporated are those principles that are fundamental to our conception of ordered liberty? And if that's the case, hasn't a wall of separation between church and state become fundamental to our concept of American ordered liberty? So I would say um, the current court is on a path and has been since Hosanna Tabor to embracing Roger Williams and rejecting um, Thomas Jefferson's view of a separation of church and state in that it comes close to embracing this idea of the freedom of the church, right? So what is inherent in the concept of ordered liberty from the original Bill of Rights on down includes diversity. And the court seems to me to be, in the way it incorporates the Establishment Clause, heading toward the worst of both worlds from um, a Jeffersonian or from uh, a secular liberties point of view, because it is eliminating, and this gets to my earlier question to Dean Chemerinsky, uh, the possibility of diversity of, of a state's embracing distance from religion, embracing something more secular, rather than embracing the Mormon church, as the state of Utah clearly would have done had it been so allowed um, at the time it entered uh, the union. Any parting comments from anybody else? Hearing none, um, I want to thank uh, everybody, um, the, the, uh, the three panelists who are still with us, the, um, the four speakers this morning, uh, people who have asked questions uh, for a truly uh, terrific um, live symposium today. Uh, we're all looking forward to um, what I think is going to be a very important uh, law review issue. Um, I wish everybody a terrific weekend. Um, goodbye from um, the, uh, as uh, Professor uh, Bejan uh, uh, reminded us earlier, um, from Rogues Island, the latrine of America. Bye-bye.